worship together and heading into this fall season uh, and the changing of the leaves and everything else, we're reminded that, you know, God is sovereign over all creation and he's made a beautiful creation uh, that we can enjoy and be blessed with. So thank you for worshiping with us. We make our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father God, we thank you for just this opportunity, the breath you have given in our lungs the, uh, to, to worship you to acknowledge that you are sovereign over all of creation and that you have made this world in the way it is. Uh, you, you've blessed us with every good and perfect gift that comes from you. Unfortunately, sometimes we misuse that and abuse that, but Lord God, uh, help us as we worship you to stay focused on you and the gifts you have given to us. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Our reading for today is taken from the book of Habakkuk, the first chapter and the second chapter, the first four verses of each. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear, or cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me, strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, write the vision Make it plain on tablets, <clears throat> so that he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. But the righteous shall live by faith. This is the word of the Lord. And thanks be to God. Our second reading is taken from 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars who con whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness of, is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hopes set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourselves to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them, so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. This is the word of the Lord. And thanks be to God. Good morning. The gospel reading for today is from Luke chapter 17, verses 1 through 10. Luke 17, verses 1 through 10. And Jesus said to his disciples, Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone was hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. 
If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like the grain of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it would obey you. Will any of you who has a servant plowing and, or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at the table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what he was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. This is the gospel of our Lord and praise to you, O Christ. So I'm reading this gospel reading. It's just clear how big of a heart our Lord and Savior Jesus has for little ones. It's as if anyone would cause a little one to sin. It'd be better if they're millstone was around their neck and they're thrown into the sea. Um, he takes quite seriously our call to care for young ones, little ones, uh, to not take away from their youth uh, and, and the vitality that they would have and the joy that they have and the trust that they have. And so he's uh, not happy when those things are, are, are violated in any way. So we we'll to have a time of prayer and let's pray that we would as a society really care for the next generation in introducing them to Jesus. Father God, we, we come into your presence and are thankful for this time together, uh, thankful for your word, the truth of your word. Um, we pray, Lord God, for um, our Christian preschool that we have here at the church, that uh, for all the teachers there and the many hours they put in and the care that they show to these little ones, introducing them to Jesus. May they just come home with joy in their hearts and bear witness to you, Lord God, uh, for, for all that you're doing in their life and just uh, be sharers of the gospel, even as little ones out of the mouth of babes. So we just pray, Lord God, for the, that continued ministry and blessings upon it. We pray, Lord God, that uh, we would... Um, seek to uphold uh, and care for young people within our, within our uh, society and that uh, they would um, have a chance to really just trust in you, put their faith in you, to look to you. So uh, may those who would seek to do evil to uh, snatch away that trust and care of, of little ones, they thwart, be thwarted in their uh, attempts at evil, Lord God, be stopped. And so uh, help us, Lord God, as the body of Christ, to be aware of any situations in our neighborhood or workplace or other places uh, where we might see that a little one is uh, being abused in any way and uh, really uh, seek to have that stopped. So Lord God, thank you for this, uh, this, year, this time together, your grace and mercy in our life, your presence, your never-ending uh, grace and love for us. Your love never fails, and we praise you and thank you for that. So we lift these things before you, entrusting them to the nail-scarred hands of Jesus, our Savior who gave his life for us, uh, who has forgiven us time and time again. Uh, we praise you, and we pray together as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. and lonely 
And all the thieves will come confess And know that you are holy And know that you are holy And all will sing out Alleluia And we will cry out Alleluia All the hearts who are content And all who feel unworthy And all who hurt with nothing left Will know that you are holy Will know that you are holy And all will sing out Alleluia And we will cry out Go on and scream it from the mountains Go on and tell it to the masses That he is gone Shout it Go that he
Good morning again. We're in our reflection this morning. We're going to be taking a look at continuing on through Paul's letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 16, uh, as he's encouraging a young Timothy and uh, the things that he will have to address uh, as he pastors the church in Ephesus. So let's uh, go before the Lord and uh, um, seek his wisdom and guidance. Father, we're thankful for this time together, for your word, which is true uh, and has been handed down to us. Uh, it's applicable to our lives right here, right now. We ask for the power and presence of your spirit to work in us and to draw us closer to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. In his name we pray. Amen. So a well-known saying in our culture um, and indeed, I think really in many cultures around the world, is respect your elders. Respect your elders. And I think that's generally good advice and uh, good practice. These are people who have been through the fire. They've been through the trials of life. And they have a lot of experience and they're still standing. <clears throat> There's a lot that we can learn from them. There's much that we can learn from their experiences, how they process these things, how they work through these things in their life. Furthermore, in the vigor of their life, they cared for others. They provided for others. They were productive and they were part of our society. Now they should be honored even as their physical stamina is waning. However, in spiritual matters, God has a little bit of a different calculus. It's not a physical age thing that he's looking at. It's a spiritual maturity thing that he's looking at. And you know, as Paul said in uh, his letter to the Corinthians in chapter three of that, but I brothers could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. So he's talking to adults here. He's going to say, I'm addressing you as infants in Christ. So as Paul continues his letter and his advice to young Timothy, who's to serve as the pastor in Ephesus, he encourages Timothy, Timothy to not let those who would judge him according to his youth to pull him down. Don't let them pull you down. Uh, it is about faithfulness to God's word that matters, not your age that God looks at. It is God who qualifies, not people. <clears throat> he also reminds people, uh, Timothy, that the charge he has been given will not <clears throat> be an easy one. It's not gonna be easy to carry this through. There's gonna be resistance, there's gonna be opposition. Upholding the truth of God's word is gonna be a constant battle. And there are many uh, things, people, things, uh, distractions that can pull you astray. So he warns him right off the bat in 1 Timothy 4, beginning at verse 1, 1 through 5. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, uh, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. Verse, verses one and two, should have any man who is given the responsibility of being a pastor examining themselves in light of God's word before they would presume to open their mouths. He says, Spirit expressly says in the later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. The Holy Spirit warns that Satan 
and the demonic are always at work to lead the church and to lead God's people astray. When a pastor deviates from the clear word of God and flirts with his own opinions and puts them out as if they're God's word, they're going on a different path. They're no longer being a mouthpiece of God, but the mouthpiece of the devil to do his dirty work which is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. We have to remember what the stakes are in all of this. No matter how flowery, no matter how lover, lovingly the false doctrine is expressed, it's the work of the devil. He reminds pastors that they uh, follow false teaching in one of two ways. Either by outright lying in other words, they know the truth of God's word and they explicitly lie about it. So liars, insincerity of liars, or by the searing of their conscience, they follow deception for so long that they no, over, no longer have any feeling about it or really care about it, about anything, that they're going down this false deceptive path. They don't even think about it anymore. They're unfeeling toward the holy things of God. I'm going to go my own path. The demonic twisting of God's word manifests itself in two equally destructive ways. The first way it manifests itself is legalism. And that's what Paul is, is getting at. He says, <laughs> they forbid marriage, Require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving. So don't marry, don't eat certain foods. And they're teaching that holiness through God can be shown and obtained not by faith, but by your works. Do these certain things. Oh, Jesus is pretty cool, but you need to do these other things as well. You need to, you need to. Uh, show you're really uh, going to be following, following God by, you know, not marrying, fully devoting yourself to the Lord, or you need to, uh, don't eat these certain foods. Those aren't the right foods for Christians to eat. That's the demonic teaching that is so easily prevalent in some churches. The other way in the twitch, twisting of God's word manifests itself is not through legalism, but through license. It's the flip side of the same coin. Uh, and what, what's going on here is people would say, yeah, God is love. That's all we're going to talk about. No need to repent. We're not going to mention that. No need to talk about obedience to the Lord. And in fact, we'll compromise on the hard things in the Bible, the things that the society around us says really isn't applicable anymore. We'll kind of take that off the plate. We'll just talk about God, God's love. What God called as wrong before, <laughs> we think we're more enlightened and we don't need to concern ourselves with that. As long as you are sincere, you can be a sincere adulterer. You can be a sincere fornicator. You can be a sincere greedy person, a sincere liar. God loves all. It's all good. It's all great. In opposition to legalism and in opposition to license stands God's word who created everything. Everything good, he said, the Apostle Paul says. And it remains so if we receive it and use it for the purposes for which God intended. And use it in a way that brings glory and honor to him. Satan is an expert at taking the good gifts of God and, just, and having us use them in a way that they weren't intended to be used. Whether it's uh, uh, our voice our ability to speak, our sexuality, all kinds of ways in which we can take and distort the good gifts of God uh, for our own purposes. Verses 6 and following. 
If you put these things before the brothers, you will be, uh, will you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Training in the Word of God is a lifelong endeavor. Because it's so easy for us to lose sight of the goal. We, you don't just like, oh, I've been confirmed in the church, I'm, so I'm done with that. I don't need to study the, the God's word or read God's word or meditate on God's word on a daily basis. Then we drift. Lifelong endeavor. For all of us, there are thousands of potential distraction we, distractions we face each and every day. Uh, a reverent and silly miss, guess what? There are a dime a dozen on the internet. And before you know it, hours can go by as you, you burrow down these silly rabbit holes that you can follow on the internet. He reminds us that while taking care of our physical bodies is of value, our spiritual health is of eternal value. But he's not saying to not take care of our physical bodies. I've seen way too much uh, cases of pastors who have not taken care of their bodies and so that they can't really serve to the uh, fullness of their capacity for the spiritual needs of people. So here's a big problem. Uh, what is the burnout rate of pastors? In 2013, a study from the Schaefer Institute reports that 1,700 pastors leave the ministry each month, citing depression, burnout, or being overworked as the primary reasons. According to the study, 90% of pastors report working 55 to 70 hours a week, and 50% of them feel unable to meet the demands of the job. The New York Times is reporting on new research that shows pastors appear to be struggling with health issues both physical and psychological, more than other Americans. The article reports members of the clergy now suffer from obesity, hypertension, and depression at rates higher than most Americans. In the last decade, their use of antidepressants has risen while their life expectancy has fallen. Many would change jobs if they could. So in my view, in order to toil for the gospel, we need to treat our Christian walk not as a sprint, but as a marathon. In a marathon, if you go out too fast, what's going to happen? You're going to tank at one point. If you go out too fast, that's it. You're out of energy. You're done. Can't go on. A pastor must realize that Jesus is the Savior, not him, and that he should labor with all of his, that is, Jesus' strength, not his own. Take care of ourselves so that we can serve, have a balance in life of these things. Jesus came in the, incarnate in the flesh. He spent time in rest and recuperation even this creator of the universe. So verse 11, it says, Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation and to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given to you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them, so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and, the, and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. 
God is the one who qualifies a pastor. We said it last week, and that's true again this week. It is not the doing that qualifies a church leader. It's not your doing that qualifies you. This is good to remember for pastors. I mean, all who work in the church, Sunday school teachers, music leaders, lawn mowing, garden work, whatever it might be, your doing doesn't make you right with God. It is God's doing that has made you right with him. Others see God working through you, though, and give glory to God. It's not a matter of age, but of faithfulness. You see the duties of the pastor as he lays it out here, and he's talking to Timothy. Devotion to worship, that is reading the word. Exhortation, that is preaching the word. And teaching the word. The call to faithfulness is emphasized again as it's so easy to get off track. He says, keep close watch. Verse 16, keep a close watch on yourself. Examine yourself. I, that's applicable for all of us, but especially for pastors. Examine ourselves. Are things uh, in a proper balance? Are we taking time for our families? Are we taking time to care for our body? Uh, to examine ourselves. Are we being faithful to God's word? Or are we going off on some tangent in some way? And he says, persist in this. Verse 16, persist in this. Uh, so that this is a marathon. It's not some sprint in which you quick rise and then you burn out and you're done, you're through. Persist in this through your life. Have something that's sustainable in your life. You're not the savior of the world. You and I aren't the saviors of the world. We need to have this balance. It is Christ that saves, but God has chosen weak and fallible human beings to convey his salvation to others. Through pastors, and indeed through the priesthood of all believers, as we live out our faith under the grace of Jesus. So when he says there, by doing so you will save both yourself and your hearers, that we're saved not by our doing, but by God's grace, and to stay connected to the vine. I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing, Jesus said. So stay connected to the source. Stay connected to Jesus. And in doing so, the grace of God will flow through you and impact other people's lives as they put their faith and trust in Jesus, our Savior. Let's pray. Father God, thank you, Lord God, for working in and through people, uh, young, old, rich, poor, many, many people through all of history. Thank you for raising up Timothy uh, to continue the work of the church way back then, and that has been passed down through the generations to such a time as this. Help pastors to be faithful to the calling that you've given to them, to have balance in their life, to uh, stay connected to the source and realize where their strength really comes from. And uh, for all of us, uh, lay people as well, for the priesthood of all believers, that we would uh, spend time each day to stay connected to the source, uh, that salvation is, from, is a gift from you, not something that we have uh, somehow made uh, ourselves uh, come to, to that point, but it's something that you have given to us. So we thank you and praise you. Lead us and guide us. All glory and honor goes to you. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let us confess together our faith in the triune God and all he has done for us. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. 
The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We have a, a time of confession before the Lord and the Lord knows what's really on our heart but what he's inviting us to do is come before him be honest before him come into his presence uh, don't hide anything from him run to him it's a mistake for us to run from God we should run towards him and confess to him so let us let's open our hearts and our minds to him there'll be a time of silence silence as well that we can really pour out our hearts to God so from the words uh, from, the, from 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's take a moment in silence to reflect upon our need for Christ. So, Lord, let us confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. But for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear the good news. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the gift of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus said to us, go into all the world, uh, making disciples in all nations and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. And so we have a tremendous privilege here in State College to reach people literally from all over the world. And so we covered your prayers. We ask that you would lift this, our ministries up, uh, particularly campus ministry and outreach to international students and, and the like and American students as well, uh, as we seek to reach the nations with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So go forth with the blessing of the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.